All right, what are we seeing this week, guys? And tell us where you're where you're viewing from. Some people put a, a couple answers in the Q and A. Okay, so now we're getting them in the Q and A. Good. Uh, right. This was probably before you enabled the chat again, but um, someone said a lot of Canadian geese. And the other person said uh, flamingos fly over Northport. So. Ooh. Nice. And they were heading north. Poor guys. All right, here we go. Margie again, long billed curlew. Oh, the, and then um, Carolyn Primus saw three immature black belly whistling ducks. Those are fun. What's really fun is when you see them sitting on a wire. Have you ever seen sitting on a wire? It's like ducks on a wire. All right. Are you teasing us? I'm I not. Know. They're big orange feet on the wire. It's crazy. I've seen wood ducks on a wire too. It's, I don't know. Um, all right. Well, small group this week. Jenny says, Jenny Cherry says, they like to sit on my neighbor's roof. That's fun to watch. Okay. Jude McCown Horde is viewing from Whitfield where we've been watching a flamingo on the sandbar. So Whitfield is really- From Whitfield, that, that's Sarasota County. That's- No, that's, that's well, no, Whitfield is still, um, it's a Sarasota address, but the line is at County Line Road, right at New College. So you're almost in Sarasota County. You know, us fanatical Sarasota birders are watching with bated breath that, that flamingos come into Sarasota County. So we're at New College prowling around looking and <laughs> Ringling Museum and. Okay, and I just fixed that panelists can chat with everyone. I'm sorry, guys. Now everyone can see if you put something in, not just the panelists. Oh, we got something else in Q&A. Oh, Sarasota, Chris Hansen's from the viewing from the meadows. Okay, small group today, but oh my gosh, it's gonna be a good one. Um, the next I'm gonna share, there we go. The Nature Center opened on um, October 1st. So come on out and enjoy the Celery Fields Nature Center. We are still looking for a few bird feeders for our bird feeder team. Um, and, you know, if you can come once a week or once every two weeks, it doesn't matter. Um, if you'll email Kim Sullivan or volunteer at sarasotaaudubon.org and let her know what when you are interested in helping out, they would love to have it. And, um, also, I didn't. I missed this in the brown pelican. Our our photographers this month are Tim Smith and Daniel and Cindy Olson. These these are our res, our artists for the month, and they are both. Um, all of them are photographers, and there's some amazing Florida wildlife on display at the Celery Fields Nature Center. So join us there. And really, um, there was a big sit yesterday. I don't know if any of you saw there uh, on SRQ Bird Alerts, there was a, a report from Stu Wilson. Um, they call themselves Celery Fields Forever, um, the Sarasota Audubon's big sit team. And they were there all day from 6.55 a.m. to 7.10 p.m. And as he put it, they scratched and clawed, but could only come up with 56 species which is an all time low. Um, putting it in perspective, they've averaged 60 species over the span of um, the years, generally speaking. 66 in 2018 was their high point. So um, they're thinking possibly um, dry, the dry weather we've had and um, some invasive species. So, um, Big shout out and thanks to everyone for handling that big sit and um, 
that's about it from Sarasota Audubon this week. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let Margie introduce our speaker. Karen, did you say that Jean is um, not able to come tonight? Not here. Yeah, she's not yeah. available tonight, but um, she'll be back next month um, to say hello to everyone. All right. All right. I'll take it away. So I am very happy to introduce Megan Barry, who's the public outreach manager for Sarasota Bay Estuary Program. So Megan is going to tell us all about the Sarasota Bay Estuary, Estuary Program and how it works with community partners to improve the science of bay management, restore wildlife habitats, habitats and increase community engagements in bay restoration efforts. And uh, I'd also like to add, and to lure flamingos into Sarasota Bay. <laughs> right, I know a guy, we're on that. Yeah, <laughs> Good. Good. Yeah. that that's, that's an important- I'm really big of... fan, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So um, Megan, I'd like to invite you to start at the beginning explaining what this program is all about, please, including the definition of the word estuary, which is really an important word for us all to know. Um, but before we do that, I just want to introduce Megan. She's a native Floridian with a personal connection to Florida's environments, wildlife, and communities. And she's out of sight. She's got four big prints of Audubon's original bird prints on her wall, right? To oh, her well, right. I got to turn the computer and show yeah, everybody. Yeah, right there. Got them all framed up. <laughs> so she's a birder at heart. Um, and so she's really into the flamingos. And she has a master's degree in global sustainability from the University of South Florida and a bachelor's degree in environmental science and policy from Florida State University. So she's as, you know, the public outreach manager, she oversees the base program and partner grants program <laughs> interfaces with the citizens advisory committee, organizes volunteer events and develops multimedia content for the overall program. Uh, she's motivated to connect people to Sarasota Bay through inclusive programs, creative storytelling, and a robust, robust network of partnerships. Take it away, Megan. Thank you. I'd also like to add that when I started, I redid our logo and I added a bird to our logo where there was not one before. So I have tried to really put birds back into the estuary programs programming and just the visual setting. So um, big birder, got a swallowtail kite tattoo, parents and family oh. obsessed with birds, just very happy to be here. Um, and we'll absolutely talk about what an estuary is as part of my presentation. Um, if you'd like, I can just jump into it or we can kind of give some high level background that's all included. So I think maybe we should just dive into the presentation if that works. Okay, awesome. Alrighty. This presentation. Are you seeing my screen? Okay, I'm just gonna minimize this. Okay, so good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining. I'm really happy to be here. I'm so thrilled to be part of this program. I've been at the Estuary program for about a year and a half. Um, as uh, Margie said, I am born and raised in Florida. Uh, although most times I'm usually not the one that's been there the longest. I'm only 26, but um, I love this state. I love these environments. And um, I'm excited to talk to you guys about the program that we have and some of the things we've accomplished lately, but also some of the challenges that we are working actively to um, combat. So you've already heard about me a little bit, um, but just, you know, at the start of each presentation, I like to talk about um, kind of what brought me here. So um, before I was with the estuary program, I was an exhibit designer for a nature center. I worked at a wildlife hospital with animals, educating the public on human impacts to birds and mammals and other local species. I then worked for local government. I was um, a neighborhood outreach services uh, coordinator for Sarasota County. So I worked with a lot of great communities and HOAs and groups to improve their neighborhoods. And um, the environment was kind of at the core of a lot of those projects. So. 
that background has brought me here. This job is just so dynamic. I work on grants. I work on outreach. I host events with kids of all ages and people of all ages. Um, so just very lucky again to be here. Um, I go in the water, on the water, around the water. So, uh, you know, we were either work from home, work from boat or work in office. So I've got three places that I work and it's all great. So today's topics uh, broken down here, we're gonna first talk about the estuary program, who we are, if you're not familiar, what we do, what our mission is. And then we're gonna talk about Sarasota Bay. So as you'll see, the name is a little bit misleading. We say Sarasota Bay, we have some details to that, what estuaries are, why the program exists, and then why Sarasota Bay is important. So um, I'm sure to each of you, you'll think maybe for the wildlife, which is one of the, the core reasons that the bay is important, but there are some other other reasons that we use to talk to politicians, to the other members of the public, just about the crucial um, you know, aspects of why Sarasota Bay needs to stay and be healthy. Uh, when we talk about managing Sarasota Bay, we talk about watersheds and nitrogen, climate change, and then a report card that we use each year to talk about the trends that we're seeing in our bay's health. So we'll go through each of that to kind of give an overview of the science behind bay management. I'll talk to you about our plan. So in light of all that, what are we doing? What are we planning for? How are we gonna to continue to take care of the Bay? And then I'll spin it around and put it back on you and talk about your role. I know some people are local. We might have some people out of state, but you'll see a lot of these environmental stewardship themes are very transferable. And obviously you're part of this program because you care about wildlife. So I guess I'm preaching to the choir a little bit, but that's not always a bad thing. All right, so the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program. It is a national estuary program. There are 28 in the country, right? So this is primarily funded by EPA. Uh, we also get money from DEP, Department of Environmental Protection. It's a state agency. We get some money from our local partners, counties and cities. Everyone kind of chips in to help us do what we do. Um, but, you know, what we're really here to do is uh, restore habitat, promote water quality, and engage the community. So to restore habitat, we work with scientists and find lands that need to be improved or enhanced. And to promote water quality, we sit down with politicians, you know, six times a year, we say, this is what you need to spend money on if you wanna promote your water quality. Um, and then obviously with the community, we educate them. I mean, the, the community it really does play the biggest role, the support that they offer the program, the people that they elect to make these um, decisions with investments, um, and just kind of the general concern that we capitalize on to keep our program moving forward. So. Um, that's what we're here to do. We've been around since 1989. The Bay has changed quite a bit just in that time frame. Um, and our mission every year is the same, but our approach changes based on the needs of the Bay. Um, so, you know, again, I'll talk to you about kind of our, our most recently updated plan and what that vision is, um, you know, in light of all the recent challenges. And here are some pictures on the left, all taken throughout the Bay. And that one at the bottom there is Quick Point Nature Preserve um, in Longboat Key. Beautiful spot to see seagrass and many birds. So an estuary, right? This is the mangrove covered, uh, you know, rookery, uh, clams, oysters, that really rich habitat that comes to mind when you think of Florida. It is not the fresh water on land. It's not the ponds. It's not, you know, uh, the water that you want to swim in. Um, or it's, it's not that green fresh water, but it's also not that blue gulf water, right? It's, it's a blend. So it's really where that fresh and salt water are meeting. It creates this unique brackish environment that is so rich in life. Um, it's so unlike anything else in the state. I mean, estuaries, they are the nursery of the sea. Um, they are the best places to see wildlife, kayak explore. Uh, you'll see environments here that you don't see anywhere else in, in the state. So the estuary, again, it's where rivers meet the sea. That's what we say. So Sarasota Bay's estuary is essentially all that land from our, all that water from our watershed coming out to the coast, but kind of being interlocked by that necklace of barrier islands. So that those barrier islands hold the Gulf back and it does bring some water in, but again, it allows for that mixing of the two types of water. So that is our estuary. These are all pictures, again, of Sarasota Bay, different parts of our bays. So, um, you know, I guess, pictures worth a thousand words. Very beautiful, very rich place. Here's a map that shows exactly what Sarasota Bay is. So what I said earlier that Sarasota Bay is a little misleading, what I really mean is that we have five bay segments. 
So we break up Sarasota Bay into these five day segments because it allows us to better manage each segment. So as you'll see here, north to south on the south on the map, we've got Palma Sola Bay, we've got Sarasota Bay, which we call Big Sarasota Bay. We've got Roberts Bay, and then we've got Little Sarasota Bay. And then finally, all the way south is Blackburn Bay. They vary in sizes. They vary in the amount of people that live in the watershed. They vary in types of habitat. Uh, they vary in how well flushed they are. So some are more salty than others. So they really are very different base segments. And splitting them up allows us to recognize patterns. It allows us to craft certain management approaches. Um, so, you know, I think if we were to say the Palmasola, Sarasota, Roberts, Little Sarasota, Blackburn Bay Estuary Program, probably not as catchy as just the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program, but um, we do work in all of these areas, and we also work in two different counties. So working in Sarasota and Manatee County. So I think our branding is a little unclear, but, um, you know, our mission, again, it's, it's broad. It covers all these areas, um, and I'm interested to talk to you guys about each of the segments. We'll go through the report card. And you'll see how these uh, segments have evolved over the years. Um, and maybe while looking at that map, you can also identify which uh, bay you live near. It sounds like a couple of you might live right near Sarasota Bay, big Sarasota Bay. We do like to start each presentation with kind of an overview like this, uh, why the bays are healthy. Some of you may already have an answer in your head, right? But a healthy bay is important to our quality of life. So everyone on this webinar tonight probably agrees. You would like to go out and go bird watching where the water is clear, where the estuaries are thriving. That's where you're gonna see some of the best wildlife. Of course, we'll all see a sandhill crane in the Publix parking lot sometimes, but it's really these beautiful, rich blue, uh, mangrove lined um, bodies of water that uh, host this, this gorgeous wildlife that brings people here for ecotourism, that keeps people here. Uh, you want to go fishing, you want to go boating, and you don't want to be in rafts of macroalgae up to your knees. You want to be able to see the bay bottom, explore it, see the fish, right? So overall quality of life for people that are here temporarily, here long term, I mean, it's what's kept me here for 26 years. So uh, broadly speaking, a healthy bay is important to our quality of life. It is also important to our economy. So we did a study, I believe in 2014, um, that Sarasota Bay had an $11.3 billion economic uplift to Sarasota and Manatee counties. And of course, with inflation, that number has only grown. But, um, you know, this is not just waterfront restaurants. It's the people that are renting your jet skis. It's the charter fishermen taking you out on the bays. It's the kayak rentals. It is the waterfront restaurants and local businesses. It's also the property taxes. People are pay are willing to pay more to live on the water than anywhere else, right? So those property taxes go to your local firefighters and local schools. And, you know, it's, it's very layered, but the healthy bay is important to our economy. In the year 2018, we had the worst red tide outbreak. We did see a decrease in property value for areas that were on the water, consistently smelling and seeing dead fish. No one wants to live by those properties, right? Or live in those properties. So we know this interconnectedness is very um, useful when we talk to our politicians about water quality. We have uh, boards, you know, that are red and blue, but every single person on our uh, policy board uh, can get behind water quality, especially here where it's it's just ingrained in, um, in our, our local, um, you know, values and uh, again, quality of life. So it's important to our economy and we know that for a fact. Lastly, or not lastly, um, second to lastly, many habitats depend on good water quality. So as I mentioned earlier, there are habitats in the estuary that you cannot find anywhere else. And depicted here is a seagrass meadow. Um, seagrass meadows, uh, it, it's just like uh, grass on land, but it, it grows underwater. And it is home to uh, invertebrates and fish that can't live anywhere else. So seagrass, it needs that certain water condition, that brackish water. Um, but it also needs clear and clean water to grow. So uh, healthy estuaries um, are integral to uh, habitats. So, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about what kind of habitats we see in estuaries, but overall just know that estuaries have been around for a very long time and they have very unique attributes, uh, these types of habitats included. And then uh, lastly, we talk about wildlife in our estuaries. So we like to say this is probably the best job you could ever have feeding baby manatees, but we also know that it is one of the saddest jobs that, um, you know, that you could have really. 
Um, manatees are a staple of the estuaries. They eat the seagrass that was just shown in the last slide. And um, that seagrass, you know, it, it grows in the estuary. So when our estuaries aren't doing well, our seagrass doesn't do well. And in turn, our manatees don't do well. So we do see trends of manatees dying and starving and, uh, you know, facing malnutrition, uh, especially the last several years. Last year, we had 800 additional deaths from manatees. And Sarasota Bay's manatees are doing all right. Um, you know, they're a little bit fatter, a little bit healthier than around the state. We really saw a lot of those losses occur on the east coast of Florida, um, where their estuaries aren't doing as well. So, you know, no one likes to talk about, you know, these, these numbers, these stats, but they really turn heads. Uh, people care a lot about manatees. And, um, you know, it's again, it's an angle that we can come at when we talk, try to convince people about the importance of our mission. So, um, me personally, I was out in the bay a few weeks ago, saw some beautiful manatees. Um, so they're out there and they're doing all right here. Um, so, you know, get out and view them and see them while they're here and while they're healthy. So as I mentioned earlier, our estuaries, it's where fresh water from land mixes with salt water from the ocean. And here is where all that fresh water comes from. We obviously know where the Gulf is, but when we say fresh water, you know, how far inland are we talking about? Where is the fresh water? So here is a picture of our watershed, and it does go pretty far inland. It's about 150 square miles north to south, um, and you know this goes all the way to the celery fields. That is a, one of you know the areas that is in Sarasota Bay's watershed. So water that falls there, unless it's stopped by a re retention pond or unless it's super dry and we're not getting a heavy flow, will make its way to Sarasota Bay eventually. So you know it, it kind of allows you to picture the scale a little bit. Um, but, you know, we can't complain, you, you know, just to give some perspective, Mississippi River has over a million square mile watershed. So sometimes we feel frustrated that we're not getting up done. We're like, eh, you know, 150 miles compared to a million miles is not too bad. But um, we do know that we've expanded our watershed over the years uh, with development. We've flattened roads, we've carved canals and creeks and brought them inland because everyone wants to live on the water. And then, you know, the result of that, we're allowing more water to be pulled to the, the bay. So with an expanding and changing watershed, uh, you know, we have to keep the health of the bay in mind and uh, evolve our management approach. And this is what Florida used to look like on the left, right? That's what our watershed used to be. It was a grassy, uh, you know, marshland. A lot of it, it was um, wetlands. It was oak forest. It was, you know, uh, there's probably people on here that know all about the habitats just like me, but many diverse Florida habitats. It used to be scrub, it used to be wetland. It was just, it was natural, it was organic. Water would fall and it would meander until it met the coast. Now, not so much. We have really created a gridded system that our water is, is forced to follow. Um, my thesis was on stormwater management, just because I find this so interesting, the way we've really carved out the landscape um, and, you know, not even known that we're changing these natural patterns so much. So in places like this on the right and subdivisions, you know, the water can't meander. It will fall down your driveway into your storm drain, down your storm drain, usually untreated either to a pond or straight out into the bay. So we're not allowing for that natural filtration as we have in the past. And this continued development brings more nutrients into our watershed. It brings more nutrients. It brings more everything, right? So this, this watershed not only has suburban development, it, there is agriculture that's used on the land in our watershed. There's recreation, there's roads with motor oil, there's urban areas with pollutants and trash, there's dog waste, you know. Um, and we've also decreased the amount of water coming in. We've expanded it, but in some areas we hold water in ponds. So we're increasing and decreasing flow in certain areas. Um, and most of all, what we're really doing is putting a lot of different unhealthy uh, pollutants into our watershed because we we're using it so much. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. You know, we all are connected to the bay. Um, I saw a picture one time of kids in a canoe in the middle of a street. And it said, we all live on waterfront property, um, you know, because really, you know, there's storm water systems right underneath us that connect to the bay. So I just thought it was a cool way to visualize that. Um, but keep that in mind when we talk about, you know, pollutants in our, when our, um, in our bay. So humans add nitrogen to the environment. Nitrogen is a big component of managing Sarasota Bay. So we add this nitrogen through our watershed, as I mentioned, in our storm water. 
We also have infrastructure like wastewater treatment systems that when they function properly don't have too much of an impact, but you know that discharge, unless it's advanced, does have nutrients in it. If it rains too much, if a storm comes through, it can uh, impact our infrastructure. So uh, we do know that our wastewater treatment has adds nitrogen to the bay, does have an impact. And then lastly, atmospheric deposition is another source of nitrogen. So power plants, they, they burn and they release nitrogen into the air and that'll eventually settle back into the water. So here are the three main channels that we're adding nitrogen. And again, a big one is our stormwater and our wastewater. Um, you know, as we've grown and developed, as we've added extra infrastructure, as we've used our watershed to our advantage, um, these are just some of the implications of that. So Sarasota Bay is a system that is sensitive to nitrogen. Um, here is a chart that shows what nitrogen can do to a water body like Sarasota Bay. All the way on the left is no nitrogen, and we don't want no nitrogen, right? And I don't think that's ever going to be a problem. But no nitrogen means no seagrass. It means no, no real life, plant life in, in your water column. So that's like the dry tortugas or somewhere that's you know crystal clear see-through water. In the middle is our optimal habitat. So there's some nitrogen, it can feed the seagrass. It allows for wildlife habitat and some type of plant life in our water. But then as we start to get too much nitrogen, we're getting increased amounts of phytoplankton, um, which can cloud the water column. We get macroalgae, which can suffocate seagrass. And it's just a very unpleasant uh, you know, uh, element in the bay for those that recreate in the bay. We get epiphytes on our um, seagrass. So that's kind of like air plants on trees, those are epiphytes. We get that on our seagrass. So increased um, nitrogen has this impact on our bay where it can start to look like a system that's you know, more than healthy. It's got way too much nutrients in it. Um, we don't like to bully the Indian River Lagoon, but if you guys remember when it was going through its, its worst time, it was, you know, super green and just so overgrown with those, uh, you know, unwanted plant life, um, that's what it might look like. So we're trying to balance this out. We, we don't want too much nitrogen. We want enough and we want to keep it right there in the optimal levels. Um, Pictured on this chart is everything that we need to, to think about when we, when we look at nitrogen. So we have seagrass, we have fish. We have phytoplankton, we have epiphytes, we have macroalgae, those five elements, we are measuring all of those. And we are not required to measure all of them. We are required to measure that phytoplankton in the water column. But Sarasota Bay, we are measuring all of five of these, either um, ourselves with our volunteers or with our partners. So we're really getting a comprehensive view at you know, where things might be off. We can see, okay, there's too much macroalgae here. That likely means there's too much nutrients in this bay. So these are our indicators um, and these are our consequences if we're not paying attention to them. When we look at Sarasota Bay, we look at a period from 2006 to 2012. That's when our bay was most healthy. Um, you know, in, in our, our recent data collection, that's what we refer to. We say this was a time when Sarasota Bay was very healthy, healthier than it is now. That is our reference period. And we know since our reference period, and some of you may have even been here, 2006, 2012, that our nutrient loads have increased by 20%. So we, we uh, commissioned a study from um, local environmental consultants and we got this data. We said, okay, we have 20%, 12 tons more nutrients in the Bay than we did when it was healthier. Um, and we know primarily because of that, it's more people, more infrastructure, more change in our watershed. So what we've done is try to categorize where these 12 tons could come from and where we could reduce them. So we do know that we can reduce the inorganic nitrogen loads by 12 tons if we think about reclaimed water, using that appropriately. Um, reclaimed water is used in irrigation inland. It makes a lot of sense, right? You know, if we're treating wastewater and it still has a nutrient uh, residue in it, let's send it inland and use it for irrigation. Let's not pump it out into the bay. Uh, it spills and overflows. We have aging infrastructure. It's expensive, expensive to fix. Our politicians, locally are investing hundreds of millions of dollars to redo um, wastewater and stormwater treatment systems. It, you know, they just like anything, they age and they don't work properly. So if we upgrade those and some are in progress, we can save six tons a year on spills and overflows alone. Uh, septic tank conversion in certain areas, we already did this, did this in Philippi Creek, but in other areas identified, we can save 20 tons a year. Um, if we do septic to sewer and get rid of that outdated infrastructure that leaks, it adds uh, human waste to our water. So this 
this alone is more than enough. And this is not the full approach. We're looking at other things, but this alone says, you know, if we can do these things, then we can reduce our, our nitrogen loads and get back to a healthier system. And we have what's called a reasonable assurance plan in progress already. We just had the Department of Environmental Protection down at our office um, on Friday, I believe, Thursday or Friday, visiting us to view this plan. This says, this is our approach. The local governments need to commit to this so we can reduce this nitrogen and we can get back. So we're holding people accountable. We're identifying what needs to get done and we're setting goals. And, you know, that's that's all because we know that nitrogen and nutrients are, are really going to make it make or break this bay. Good news is that observations are showing we're on the right track. We just released this information last week. Uh, our executive director, Dave, and some of his other uh, state scientist colleagues were out on Sarasota Bay looking at areas that had lost a lot of seagrass last year and the following years. Um, and he called me so ecstatic. He was, oh my gosh, you won't believe it. We have so much seagrass in this area and there was none here last year or the year before. And he just could not believe it. So we're seeing seagrass come back in areas that it has died often because of consistent and proper management. Um, and this was in upper Sarasota Bay. So, you know, in the Northern part of that uh, map that I showed you, this is in that Northern area. Um, and this is not really a surprise. Uh, I'll talk to you about some trends and what we've seen, but this is just good news. And um, this, uh, the Swift Mud a Southwest Florida Water Management District, they do official mapping. They go in a helicopter and look at all the seagrass and give us numbers. They do that every December and January. So we're gonna get official numbers uh, in the coming months, but this is, this, again, this is an observation. We went in the water and we saw this. Um, but the data will support these observations, uh, hopefully, in the coming months. So we'll keep everyone posted. Stay tuned with the program for some updates on our seagrass beds. All right, now back to bad news. Um, <laughs> future complications. So uh, with Sarasota Bay, we've already talked about how it's changed over time, and we know it's going to continue to change. Uh, I just saw the Sarasota County survey results today that the county does, and growth and development continues to be a top concern for residents. It's also a top concern for us. We know people want to be here. Um, you know, we're not going to close the door behind us when we move in, but there has been a lot of growth and development um, that's continuing to um, take away natural areas, natural filtration capabilities, um, and impact our watershed. Uh, so we can't just hold the line or, you know, limit pollution based on old standards. We have more people now. So how are we going to do better and do more? You know, we need to continue to think that way. Um, and we're going to focus on the next 30 years. We really need to, to bite size our future plans. We're going to see climate change. We're going to see more people. So let's not focus on five, 10 years. Let's focus on these 30 year increments really and start planning out and having a vision for not just, you know, the, the tenure of our current director, but to more than that. Um, and then we're seeing more localized issues like vinyl seawalls. So concrete seawalls host oysters. They, you know, if you, if you go by an old concrete seawall, you won't even see the concrete. You will see only oysters and barnacles. And that's a good thing because oysters filter water and they're very important to our bay. But people are now replacing concrete seawalls with vinyl or plastic seawalls because it's cheaper and because they're marketed as being more durable, which we understand, you know, if, if you're a homeowner and you can save money, you know, why not? But we're seeing now that we're losing oyster populations because of this trend. And this is its own issue. It could be its own presentation. Um, but what we're really trying to do is get ahead of that and educate people on what they can do to mitigate that. Um, or just say, hey, if you have the option to do concrete, do concrete. And then, of course, climate change is something that's always talked about when we talk about managing our environments, whether it be terrestrial, bay, oceanic. Climate change is always part of the conversation. So we're not staring away from that either. We're going to see a, about nine inch increase in our um, our bay waters. And, you know, nine inches is not catastrophic. It's not going to cause anyone to to retreat in the next 30 years, but it is going to impact our mangroves. Uh, our mangroves need to breathe. They have, you know, um, pneumatophores that stick out of the soil and they breathe. So if the water keeps coming up, they'll eventually suffocate out. So we need to let them crawl back up a little bit and continue to breathe. So that's that's a localized management, um, you know, reaction to to what we know is coming. We're seeing increased temperatures. We're seeing changing rain patterns. We're seeing more tropical events. In the following slides, I'm gonna walk you through some data to support these points. Again, this could be its own presentation. If you have questions, we'd be happy to answer, but we're just gonna show you some numbers that support these um, or you know, kind of these themes that we're using here uh, when we look into the next 30 years. 
Our closest sea level gauge is in St. Pete. We don't have one that's in Sarasota or in Manatee County, but St. Pete's just up the road. So we're comfortable using this data. And you'll see here, this is the uh, sea level in St. Pete at certain times throughout the day. And of course, with full moons, with spring tides, there's variability, but what we're really focusing on is that red line, that trend. So we are seeing our sea level increase. Um, and this is not just in Sarasota Bay, you know, uh, every local or um, coastal management group will have their own interpretation or analysis of sea level. Ours is using figures like this, and we're comfortable saying nine inches over the next 30 years. And I really like this diagram because it's very visual. So this is the average uh, temperature, um, air temperature um, taken at the airport, which is obviously a, a great place to take the temp uh, temperature. You know, it's consistent uh, environmental um, aspects throughout the day. You're not getting, you know, uh, shade over trees and everything like that. It's in an airport where it's sunny and you get a consistent gauge. And you can see here, we're getting more warmer days. Uh, we used to start off August in the, some of the August days would be in the 60s. I don't remember that since I was, you know, much younger. And I do remember growing up and my mom would have certain sheets that she would take out of the closet and put over plants at night to, to keep them from, uh, you know, the frost. And I don't remember the last time she did that. And I don't remember me need, ever needing to do that living on my own. So um, little anecdotes like that can sometimes help us remember uh, how it used to be and how it's changing. So we're seeing warmer temperatures and with warmer temperatures comes an uh, increased growing period for things like macroalgae uh, that like the warm temperatures. Um, that's good for the mangroves because they die off in freezes. But in certain parts of Florida, we're losing salt marshes to mangroves because um, mangroves they're not they're not getting threatened they're just they're thriving which some people might like but you know we have a habitat restoration site up here um near Anna Maria Island and the signage that was there said hey this is a salt marsh and we were walking the site thinking about how can we redo this and said well this is not a salt marsh anymore this is a mangrove forest so uh we're seeing changes because of this this increased trend in air temperature and I don't need to tell you how hot it was this summer if you were here you felt it uh, it's brutal. So this is something we're planning for all in all. This is a diagram. These two show the trends in major hurricanes and tropical storms. As you can see for yourself, we are seeing more hurricanes and more tropical storms with that increased um, warmer water. And the tropical storms and hurricanes absolutely impact our bay, uh, not permanently, but temporarily they can impact our bay, impact our quality of life, impact our economy, all of those things. So we're planning for more storms and more hurricanes, and really our approach is proactive. We want a resilient bay that can rebound quickly from these because we can't fight off hurricanes, of course. We just can prepare for them just like everyone else. This photo went viral, uh, semi-viral. Uh, I had a, a photographer go out and take pictures of our bay uh, just, you know, at a random October. I said, hey, let's get some aerial footage of our bays. They look gorgeous. And then after the storm came, I said, you know, I've been hearing a lot of complaints that uh, uh, Blackburn Bay is not looking very good. Can you go get some photos? And this was a few days after Ian, and you can absolutely tell the difference. So this water looks a lot worse than it is, mostly is tannin. So a lot of, you know, um, leaves, sediments, branches, organic material was just washed into the bay. A lot of, uh, you know, nasty stuff too, but a lot of it was just vegetation. And when that starts to break down, it makes the water more tannic. It adds more nutrients. Think of like a compost pile on the bottom of the bay, right? That's It's not going to smell good. It's not going to look good, but it's definitely not permanent. Um, but this was very visual way to communicate to people that our bays are impacted by these, um, these tropical storms and hurricanes. And as I mentioned earlier, a cleaner bay is a more resilient bay. So our bays that are healthy can bounce back quicker. They are more likely to, uh, you know, kind of re revive themselves. Our well flush bays will flush out that water and kind of, you know, the ecosystems will rebound and come back to life. So if we're not an already impaired system that's suffering with nutrients and low on environmental value, it's going to have more of a potential to rebound after such events. So uh, we did see that in most of our bays. One of our bays, Little Sarasota Bay, took a little bit longer to get back to, um, you know, a healthy state. And that's primarily because it's not as well flushed. Uh, so we saw a lot of stratification. We saw a huge layer of fresh water sitting on top of our normal bay water. And it created a hypoxic environment where things, small things at the bottom that couldn't swim away, they died. And the water just kind of sat there. It was very brown, very gross. So 
you know, there's not much we can do with the flushing there. Um, if you're familiar with the midnight pass, that's a whole other presentation as well. But, um, you know, we just, we keep this in mind and we think about what are ways that we can, uh, despite these challenges, make these bays more resilient. All right, so kind of, you know, I, I've mentioned how we plan and uh, now I'm gonna get into a little bit more about how we monitor the health of Sarasota Bay. So on the left here is our staff scientist, Jay. He's been with the program for a very long time. Uh, he's retiring next year. We're sad to see him go, but he's just left quite a legacy here. Total side note, just thought I'd bring that up. Um, he is out in the field looking at our seagrass. We have a volunteer program called Eyes on Seagrass, where uh, we train volunteers to go out and take measurements of the seagrass, you know, how, how copious it is, if there's anything on top of it, epiphytes, macroalgae, all that. So we gather data on seagrass each year. That's what's pictured here. All the way on the right is um, uh, our team out on the water right after Hurricane Ian came through. Um, some agencies took weeks to sit down and talk about how they're going to get a plan together, what they're going to monitor, who they're going to, uh, you know, have join them. Our director, uh, he's awesome. In two days, he had a plan. Uh, they had a meeting, they had a plan, they went out in the water. And then in two days, we were out there gathering data on um, what the impact of the storm was on our bays. That was the roughest boat ride I've ever had in my life. It was a it was a Carolina skiff. It's like a basically a canoe with a motor. We're at the Gulf and I just get beat the whole time. Um, I just, I, yeah, I felt like I got hit by a bus the next day, but all in the name of science, right? All in good faith. Um, so, you know, like just, I guess the summary is that we act quick. So we we monitor at Sarasota Bay in long-term, we monitor it in short-term, we have certain events um, and I'll walk you through some of that right now. So our uh, report card shows us these trends in monitoring. Uh, we have a whole web page devoted to this. If you're interested in anything I'm saying, go visit our website. We break it down, as you can see on the right here, um, and really talk about the science of everything. I'm going to give it more of a high level tonight. But our report card uh, measures our bay based on our nitrogen, our chlorophyll, which is that, you know, basically what makes the water green. It's our, our floating little algaes. Uh, we measure it in our seagrass. We measure our macroalgae. So we take these four measurements and we, uh, we gauge you know, their presence in the bay, and then we score our bay um, based on these attributes. And we look back at our reference period when it was healthy and say, okay, are we, are we worse than last year or better than last year? And we, we look for trends. So we have A, B, C, and D, you know, grade level points. A is great, we're doing good, nothing needs to happen. B is, yeah, we're doing really good, but you know, you know don't, don't take your eyes off the ball. C says, okay, there's, there's some issues going on here. And, D says, all right, we really need to focus on this base segment. Something uh, major is going wrong and we can't continue as is. Here are our results for the last several years. Uh, as you'll see here in the green, 2006, 2012, our reference period, everything was blue and green. It was beautiful. You know, we had a blip there in Blackburn Bay back in 2011, but everything was just gorgeous, right? Um, and then in 2013, things started to slip. And that was the start of five years of untreated wastewater treatment overflows in Sarasota. Um, they, uh, this was caught by a local advocacy group. They noticed that the water quality was off as did we, and they sued, the city fixed their wastewater and we've been getting back on the right track. But with those reds, you'll see that was coupled with super heavy uh, rainfall. It was coupled with uh, storms. It was coupled with the wastewater. So it just, with all of that said and done, we had a horrible red tide in 2018 that carried into 2019 that really affected those par parts of the bay. Slowly in each bay segment, we've started to come back. Um, Palmasola Bay, farthest north, um, that one continues to be healthy. I think Palmasola Bay was almost unintentionally built very green. It's, this is old communities up here. We have grassy swales on the side of the road instead of stormwater pipes. You know, it's just it was just built differently and it's it's keeping the bay healthy. I think that's one of the big elements. Upper Bay was healthy. Roberts Bay, relatively healthy. Little Sarasota Bay, as I mentioned earlier, after Hurricane Ian did not flush well, had a lot of stratification. It caused wildlife kills. Um, so, you know, for those reasons, primarily that slipped into the yellow and then Blackburn Bay also into the green. So, we know Hurricane Ian had an impact on these scores and we were expecting it, um, but we overall saw more macroalgae in these bays. Um, we saw more nutrients because of the rain, because of the storm. So this wasn't really a surprise to us. Um, we wanted to have all blues, of course, but you know, blues and greens are not bad. Um, and Little Sarasota Bay certainly started a discussion um, about the flushing. 
Moving past our scores uh, is into our plan. So what we do, since we are federally funded, we have a trillion reports and a trillion plans. I swear, the second we finish a government report, we have to start another one. So it's quite exhausting. But the big one is our comprehensive conservation management plan. This is uh, done in five-year increments. So we look at everything in our bay, habitats, community engagement, science, and we, we come up with a plan. This was just done in 2022. Here's a little QR code if you want to scan it and see it. But of course, this is on our website and it goes through every single thing that we think needs to get done in the next five years. It holds us accountable, but it gives us a vision. So I wanted to tell you about our plan and just give you the spark notes of the plan. It's a uh, PDF form, I think 120 pages, um, but we've made it into a very friendly navigable story map that you can look through. So with water quality, you know, and again, these are these are high level. These are, uh, you know, consistent things we see, but we look at specific projects and approaches each five years. So impacts of development on our surface water, it's our, you know, uh, ponds and, you know, our wetlands and our what hits the, the road and runs down into the street, our groundwater, our pollutants, and our goal is just is to reduce that. So we are encouraging our politicians to invest in their infrastructure we're monitoring harmful al algae blooms. But really, again, that big thing is investment, 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 especially in stormwater systems. We're doing more bioswills. We're, we're, we're helping with the Healthy Ponds Initiative to get these neighborhood ponds um, into optimal func functioning condition because they do play a role in treating water before it enters the bay or stopping it from going in in certain instances. For habitats, of course, development is another problem. Um, we are protecting and restoring habitats we just came out with a uh, five-year or four-year plan using bipartisan infrastructure law funds. It's almost $3 million in funding that EPA is going to give us over the next um, you know, three fiscal years to uh, improve habitats. And we have a plan starting with you know, community green spaces that are on bayous all the way up to um, you know, areas that people can't get to. So we've come up with a list of project ideas with our partners, with our counties and city officials, saying this is the most important habitat for our community and for our wildlife, and we have a plan to restore those. And if you'd like to see that list, I'd be happy to share it. For fish and wildlife, of course, human influences. So we're really trying to uh, talk to our marinas and talk to our fishermen about safe fishing. Uh, you know, we have someone on our citizens advisory committee that owns or works at a bait shop and she teaches tourists and local fishermen how to safely unhook pelicans and how to be a, a bird friendly fisher. So we're supporting uh, initiatives like that as Sarasota becomes increasingly more popular by tourists and locals for ecotourism. We have a whole campaign dedicated to seagrass safe boating um, that we're continuing to beef up. We have maps of our seagrass. You know, it, we talk about manatees and how to be safe around manatees. So this is just ongoing. This is more uh, continuing to push the same messaging and really get it out to people that are new in Florida, here in Florida just for the you know spring break or long-term residents that really just have never been educated on this stuff. And then lastly, for community engagement, um, lack of access is a big thing. We really think that you should be able to enjoy the bay, even if you don't have a boat or you don't have your own kayak. So we're working to put more kayak launches in. We're working to restore boardwalks that have been dilapidated and literally cannot be walked on. Um, we're working to add more interpretive signage to certain preserves. Uh, so we're, we're trying to increase access and awareness and accessibility of the bay. You know, it, the privatization, privatization of a lot of land can deter people from entering the base. So really trying to find those access points and enhance them and you know, make them more public, make them more welcoming. Uh, and of course, with that comes stewardship. So at a lot of these preserves that we're enhancing, we'll have volunteer events where people come out and they put plants in the ground, they take trash out, you know, it increases that sense of ownership. This bay does belong to all of us. And, you know, getting out there and actually helping our bay, being on the water, it just creates that connection that uh, some people just have lacked. Um, so we try to do that along with being, in improving our, um, our bay access. And here's our impact report. So this is where we have come the last year. Uh, we have 19 projects completed, uh, a, Pretty good chunk of that are local community driven projects. We have a grant program. We give out money to neighborhoods and businesses and nonprofits uh, to do environmental projects and they get them done. And so, you know, nine, I think 11 of those are smaller projects and the remaining are these bigger projects that we've done. 125 acres of environment enhanced to restored in those projects. We've had, you know, hundreds of volunteers participate in our cleanups. We have students that are engaged at our events and at our programs, a lot of them Title I 
We pay for field trips so students who have never been on the water get to come out and see the water. Uh, lots of shoreline improved, um, tons of native plants installed at our preserves, and then this impressive number here, 27,000 pounds of debris removed. This is from cleanups that we've per personally participated in or cleanups that we've sponsored. There are a lot of wonderful uh, groups locally that are literally diving underwater, going underwater in scuba gear to get um, discarded fishing gear, derelict crab traps, or, you know, they're just, they're out there kayaking with a bunch of people picking up trash from the mangroves. So we pay for the, their work. We give them money so they can keep doing what they're doing. But we also um, often get together and we'll actually remove trash ourselves. And as I promised at the beginning, I'm gonna route it back to you by doing your part. Of course, you being here tonight and hearing me out is you know, one of the best things you can do, just be educated and learn more. Um, but if you're continued, if you're interested in continuing that you know, journey to learn more, visit our website. We have a really great page on there for Bay Friendly Living Guides. And it talks about what you can do in your home, what you can do in your community, uh, what you can do in your yard. It just goes into every aspect of your life and gives advice for, hey, have you thought about trying this? This is good for the Bay. Very clear, very easy to follow. Um, read it and share it with others if you can. As I mentioned, uh, we offer grants. So uh, we have a grant program that's going to open in January. It opens January 1st each year. It's $10,000. Sarasota Audubon was a grant recipient last year, and I loved what they did, and I actually highlighted them in our promotional video um, we gave Sarasota Audubon money to buy uh, Spanish language uh, bird books and new binoculars, um, and they brought out uh, Hispanic families, and you talked to them about the wildlife and the birds and the bay, and um, it was just such an awesome program. So uh, obviously you guys are familiar, but if you are part of a neighborhood, I know the meadows you guys are on here, you've received several grants from us before, um, and I, I believe this past year just received one as well. Uh, we cover a lot of different things. Contact me if you have questions. But then on our website, I just today listed a bunch of other local grants that are here because we don't want to just keep all the good projects for ourselves. Florida Native Plant Society has grants. The counties have grants. So check those out if you have a project in mind. Volunteer events. We do habitat restoration. We do cleanups. This last week, we were celebrating National Estuaries Week. So we did a Sunset and S'mores kayak down in Little Sarasota Bay. That was a ton of fun. Uh, when I started, I thought, you know, I don't want people to just come out and do backbreaking, sweaty work, even though I want that. I want them to come have fun with us. So we really tried to beef up these recreational programs and just connect with people. And I think that's received well. So we're offering more of those. I talked about our Eyes on Seagrass program. We also are promoting vertical oyster gardens. Um, these are strings of oyster shells from local restaurants, dried out, drilled, and then hung under docks to grow new oysters. So that's a whole program in and of itself. It's on our website as well. If you have a dock or you you have a community dock, uh, get some bogs. You know, the, it, it increases habitat. It's fun to watch, monitor, see all the growth. It's just a really good way to engage people in um, bay habitats. We also do tours of our restoration sites. We'll come out to you. We'll talk. Uh, you know, if you want to hear from us, we want to, uh, you to hear us. So just let us know how you how and where you want us to come speak with you and we'll make it happen. Lastly, enjoy the bay. I already told you guys this, just getting out and being part of the bay and getting on the water and, you know, just increasing your appreciation for the bay really does go so far. I actually feel like the reason I thrive in this job is because I have that background and growing up in the mangroves and just being barefoot and walking through and like picking up the gross egg sacks that you'd find at the beach and putting them in a bucket and throwing them on my dad <laughs> just really immersing myself in the like the, the creatures of the bay and the environment. So I really think that personal connection goes so far. So just go enjoy the bay. It's the easiest thing you can do. And that's my presentation. This picture was taken a few weeks ago to clean up. Um, and I'm sure you have questions. I'm happy to hear them. I appreciate you sitting through this with me. I, I hope I didn't go too far over time, but I've really enjoyed being here and speaking with your group. So I'll wrap things up there. That was great. I don't know about everybody else, but I, I learned so much. I I didn't, you know, I've heard all these uh, diff, disparate things, but uh, I think that was a very, very informative program. So thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'm glad that you thought so. I had a hard time picking what to share because obviously there's so much that I could that I could say tonight. So um, if there's anything that I didn't cover fully or anything you have questions on, please let me know. So we have some questions, I think, in the chat, do we? You're getting compliments, a beautifully yeah. clear and interesting presentation. Thank you, Megan. 
Thank you Christine very much. Hoffman. Well done. Excellent. You go, girl. <laughs> um, and a question from Suzanne Demeron. Where did the 27,000 pounds of debris end up? That's a really good question. Most of the time when the trash is removed, it's separated on a massive tarp. So what can be recycled is recycled. If there's certain crab traps that still have tags on them and belong to people, they're returned. Um, a lot of it is waste that will go to the landfill, but again, it's sorted out and things that are recycled are recycled properly. Um, so, you know, our teams do a good job at sorting through the trash. We found urns with ashes. We found BB guns. We found just very weird things, um, but we do our best to properly discard of everything. Definitely Somebody... not back in the water though. And that's, that's the good part is that it's not going back in the water. So. Exactly. So Jenny Cherry wants to know, what is a watershed? A watershed is the area of land that drains to the ocean or the bays. So that's really defined by topography. Um, think about the flat, you know, a slope up will all drain this way. And then if you have a mountain and a slope down, it's going to drain that way. So our watershed is really defined by the elevation in land. So the certain elevation that drains into Sarasota Bay is the Sarasota Bay watershed. So I have some questions. Um, what what do you do specifically in Manatee County? And I hope you're scolding them roundly for getting rid of the the buffer. wetland buffers. The wetland. Yeah, it's difficult because um, you know, we sit down with the politicians, but uh, not every decision they make is in our best interest, obviously. Um, but Manatee County uh, is a wonderful partner. They have so many beautiful coastal preserves here. We will provide funding to enhance those preserves. We'll provide volunteers to do projects at the preserves. One of our biggest projects we have coming up is actually called Fish Preserve, which is right next to the Florida Maritime Museum. It's 100 acres of land. Some of it's submerged aquatic lands, but it's 100 acres that was bought by the community. Um, I think about 30 years ago, um, and we have helped them restore this land because it was Australian pines, it was not native. And we have throughout time come in there, cleared it, made it a wetland again. Uh, the day that we started allowing water in, we saw, you know, wading birds and fish. So that is one of our biggest high profile projects. And we actually have a ribbon cutting event um, coming up on November 3rd for that project. Where is so Manatee that? County, that is, if you look at the Florida Maritime Museum, it's just maybe. Where is that okay. museum? Cortez. Before, Cortez, Cortez. Cortez. Yep, right before the Cortez Bridge to Anna Maria Island. Um, so Fish Preserve is one of our biggest preserves in Manatee County. We have uh, we have an, another um, preserve right off uh, the Palmasola Scenic Highway that's getting um, restored during our BIL uh, project list. So that'll be not this year, but the following. Again, working with them on their current coastal preserves. Um, and then their natural resources director, Charlie, is very in tune with our program. We talked about the vinyl seawall issue, and he's already looking at how he can work with um, waterfront developments to kind of mitigate that and do some of the, the concrete panels on top of that to, to combat the lack of oysters that are growing awesome. on those. So they're very involved. Manti County is they're a great partner. So Judy McCown uh, Horde wants to know, we have a property, she says, we have a a uh, property on the bay and grasses are not growing. Where do I obtain mangrove um, pro propagols? And where can I get um, sand to restore shoreline? That So I'm glad to hear that you're interested in restoring it. Uh, nurseries will actually sell mangrove pro propagules, but we also get um, school groups a lot that will grow them. And they ask us, you know, where can we put these? And sometimes we don't have anywhere. So um, I'll put you on the list for school grown mangroves if you're interested, but you can get them in bulk at native nurseries. Mangroves are very resilient um, and very, very easy to plant. You just stick it right in the ground. So, um, you know, with some patience, you'll have some beautiful mangroves there. Regarding the sand, I'm not quite sure where you'd get it. That's more of a question for our habitat restoration staff scientist. Um, I'm sure there's a local supplier somewhere, um, but I can definitely put you in contact with him and he can give you his, his resources for stuff like that. Awesome. Um, Jenny Cherry asks again, is there any way the Sarasota government can make a few, ma I'm sorry, make a law to stop companies from using bad fertilizers to prevent them from going into the bay? There's already a, uh, a wet 
season fertilizer ban right now that, that Sarasota County has in place uh, where you're not allowed to use certain fertilizers in certain quantities. Um, actually, I don't think you're allowed to use any uh, in the wet season. And it's just an enforcement issue. You can still go to the store and buy fertilizer, even when you're not allowed to use it. And that's something that we've had an issue with for a long time is if you're not allowed to use it, why are you allowed to sell it? Um, so there is a ban in place. It's a law. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure about the, again, the intricacies of the enforcement, but it's something that we try to promote to people. You know, you don't really even need to fertilize there in the wet season. Dry season fertilizing, if done properly, will not have an impact on the bay. If, you know, if you're over fertilizing your lawn, then it's not getting absorbed into the grass and it will get washed away. But if you're fertilizing properly, a lot of people really like gardening, we get it, um, then it's not going to have an impact. So I would answer your question by saying it's really about education. Don't fertilize in the wet season. And if you are going to fertilize in the dry season, do it properly. But there is a law in place for that already. I have a comment about that. What wet season? <laughs> Did How was, I, I know, how, was how was it affected this year by the drought? You know, I did um, the big sit that Karen referred to. And I was in uh, Surrey Fields, Palmer Road um, yesterday. And it's depressing. The water yeah, level is low is and the lack of energy in the field, celery fields, is quite st astonishing. So I'm not sure much is flowing anywhere, including to the bay. Yeah, you know, um, we don't want that to be a, a trend, but we do know that the, the reduced rainwater has had a positive impact on Sarasota Bay. Um, you know, positive. Know, yes, it's positive. Because think about it, as I was saying in the presentation, more rainwater brings more nutrients. So we've had less nutrient introduction into the bay. It's been, uh, you know, more salty because of that less fresh water, but the water's been more clear and it hasn't had as much nutrients in certain areas where we've had stormwater outfalls. Um, and, you know, we're not trying to wish for that, right? But we know that, you know, it's, it's allowed the water clarity to persist in times of the year when normally it wouldn't because it'd be too wet. Um, but we do want the rainwater. I mean, of course, we had to cancel a lot of our volunteer planting events because we just didn't have enough rain. So I have a I have a an odd question, and I don't want to put you on the spot. But is it safe to swim in the bay? I've 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 been to bars where guys say they've been swimming and they got really mortally ill. So I've I've avoided swimming in in uh, the bay. That's, you know, that's a really wise question um, and not a bad question at all. Uh, I would say, yes, I've swam in the bay many times. Uh, there are certain times of the year and after certain events where you wouldn't want to swim in the bay, you know, after a hurricane, definitely don't want to go in the bay with an open wound. Uh, you would not want to swim in urban downtown Sarasota. The new bay park right down there, they wanted to put a bathing beach. We said, oh, it's not too good of an idea. Just just put a, a beach where people can view the water and not swim there because a lot of pollution comes out to that point of the bay. But if you go up to Palmasola Bay, and if you go to, you know, out far enough in the bay, it's gorgeous. You know, you'll see seagrass and dolphins and manatees, and you're not going to get, you know, 10th Street runoff coming into your, your float. Um, so I would say absolutely it's safe. We encourage it. Um, but just be aware of when and where you're swimming in the bay. And uh, we don't measure bacteria, but our local uh, partner, Suncoast Water Keepers, they do measure bacteria levels, and they'll post each week uh, their findings. And so that's another way to stay updated with where to swim. Oh, that's yeah. great. Karen, did yeah. you want to say something? Well, Pomasola, you don't want to swim by the causeway because that's where the dogs are. And so there is often alerts in Pomasola in that area. So you're, you're very right. So North Pomasola yeah. is not as well flushed. There are, uh, it's a dog beach, but there are also horses that, um, recreate there. And that was a whole conversation a few weeks ago with the city commission. They did some bacteria testing and they found that um, it's not necessarily linked directly to horses, but the horses stomp on the seagrass. They're decaying seagrass the has a single bacteria trace. So yeah, that's another example of areas you wouldn't really want to go swimming. Don't go North Pomasola, go more South Pomasola. Um, I, it's much safer there. Um, yeah. But you know, we definitely, you know, I think maybe we could do a better job of educating the public on the, the best places to swim because there is a misconception that the bay is not healthy. Um, you know, I had a friend tell me that her grandpa used to go up to Tampa Bay and just take raw oysters out of the bay and eat them. And I'm like, you could not do that now. So, uh, we, you know, they're, they're changed systems, but I think there's still a lot of viability in swimming and enjoying them. And maybe that's a good point. Maybe we need to do a little bit better at updating people. 
right. Well, I think this has been great. I I really appreciate everything you're saying and all you're doing. And I know Karen and Jean Duby have spoken very highly of your organization. And I'm sorry I didn't know until now that how important you are. And I thank you so much for uh, making us much more aware of all the fine things you're doing. Oh, thank you very much for saying that. I'm so happy to connect and I'd love to, you know, present again uh, should the opportunity present, present itself. So we really appreciate it. Great. Thank love you very much. You. And I'm just going to put the last slide, which is our usual. So um, who do we have next month, Margie? You got me I off. I put you on the spot. I'm sorry. I can't. I, here I make the program. I'm supposed to know this. But what, who do we have? Uh, we have, um, who do we have? We have um, the Japanese, the gentleman from Japan. Oh, we have the, um, your friend. You take it away and tell us. It's, it's um, Miss Moscow, she's Rosemary Ross. Oh, Mos she's not December. She's December. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So next week, uh, next month. I'll get it together right now. Um, so next month we'll have um, a very well-known um, birder and naturalist who is in Japan. And um, it's not that Japanese in Japan don't have a lot of naturalists or birders, but a lot of them only speak Japanese. So. Um, I, I have a J Japan background and had a very passionate interest to get someone who could speak to us in English fluently to talk about birding birds and the whole uh, of Japan. And Japan is an amazing bunch of islands uh, with a, a very long mountain range um, and lots of different birding um, environments. So we're going to have um, a very famous, a well-known um, Japan and actually East Asia birding expert talk to us uh, for November. Awesome. All right. Something to look forward to. And thank you, Ma Megan. Um, I should have put there sarasotabay.org, right? Yes, that's it. sarasotabay.org is their website. So um Anything you need, you can find there. And um, until next time, we'll see you all. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Have a nice night, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much, everybody.